I'm Michael Maxey. I'm the VP of Technical Business Development at Zadita. Uh, I'm also the LF Edge or the Linux Foundation Edge board chair. So I do a fair amount of work in open source as well. Uh, previous to Zadita, sort of a long history in product management in the enterprise tech space. So uh, everything from PKI to uh, storage area networks, if you're old enough to remember SANS and McData back in the day. Uh, today we're going to talk about Zadita. Uh, we have a great lineup. I'm joined by a couple technical experts. I'll let them introduce themselves here in just a minute. Uh, but we wanted to start out with kind of a quick overview on who we are, where we came from, and really a focus on our customers, because that's really what helps tell our story. Uh, but as I know you're not a shy group, so please ask questions as we go along. And let's just sort of jump into it. Um, so I wanted to start with a quick company history. Um, you know, we were founded in 2016 with sort of two theses that have really proved true over time. Uh, the first was that more and more devices and more data is coming online at the edge. And we're seeing that everywhere from your refrigerator to edge computing, and we'll go through a lot of examples around that today. The second thesis was around the way you build applications in the cloud is the future of how you build applications. So think 12-factor applications, containerized workloads. And what we noticed is the combination of those two, uh, at the time, the, the conventional wisdom was you take all that data that's being produced on the edge, you copy it into the cloud, you run your analytics or, or whatever you want to do in the cloud, and voila, you're solved. Reality was networks are built for download. We built asymmetrical telecom networks so we could download content, not upload content from the edge. And the fact of moving all that data, let alone cost of moving that data, really wasn't a reality. So we set out day one to solve that, to really bring a cloud-like experience to devices that you own and run highly distributed on the edge. Um, we you know, started, um, as I mentioned, in 2016. Uh, we, first thing we did is we open sourced uh, an operating system. It's called EVE. It stands for the Edge Virtualization Engine. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on that today. We'll go into the weeds of what EVE is, what it does, how it works. Uh, we wrote that operating system, we open sourced it into the Linux Foundation Edge Group. It's now Apache licensed and community developed. Um, we then sort of moved forward to our first production customer. So this was 2020, almost five years ago. Uh, we signed our first production customer, which was an oil and gas services company, a very large company. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of security rules, lots of networking challenges. Uh, what they were doing is taking devices with our software, putting them into trucks, and rolling out into oil wells. And I'll talk more about that use case in just a minute. But what we learned from that customer is really how to harden our product in a lot of ways. Uh, for example, um, they came to us at one point and they said, you know, we're deploying these trucks at well sites. Uh, well sites, they handle explosives. And we can't have radios running when they're handling explosives because they could trigger an explosion. And they said, well, it's very easy to remotely turn off the radio, because that's how we control our systems. But how do we turn it back on? Right? So these are the types of challenges we've solved for our customers over a number of years. The short answer there is we built a local utility that allows them to use our API to manage their nodes. But these are the types of scenarios we've been solving for the last five years for really large enterprise companies. Um, We've raised a fair, about a, a fair amount of money. Um, we introduced some application services in 2023. So last year, uh, we'd sort of developed our platform to a point where we started building services on top of that. So think about uh, attestation services so you can um, verify your workloads are secure. Uh, accessing people, like logging into these devices, configuration utilities, Kubernetes utilities. So we built a number of services that we've introduced into the platform. Um, and then in 2024, we, we, you know, we raised our Series A. I don't want to talk about our funding. I know you guys don't talk about it. You kind of mentioned that in the, in the... But there's two important points there. One is we're a fully funded business. So what that means is we, are, we have enough cash to get us to profitability and beyond, which means we no longer have to go out and run that, that race with the VCs. Very secure company, lots of money in the bank. We can build our company. Our customers know we're going to be there, and so we're a long-term entity. The other point I would make around our investors is a lot of them are customers. Um, and they see us as strategic enough to their operations that they wanted to invest in the company. So you see logos like Emerson and Chevron and others that are not only investors in our company, but customers of our company. And they do that because we tend to run in the OT side of the house, which is operational technology, where all of the dollars are made and where the core business runs. And I'll take you through a bunch of examples on that right now. Um, 
So in our customer space, um, we wanted to highlight maybe some verticals. Um, the rest of the team is going to go into three very specific use cases where we'll get into the weeds of exactly what we're doing for a couple of these customers. But at a high level, we wanted to kind of highlight some of the industries and customers that, that we're working with. Uh, as I mentioned, we started in oil and gas services. Um, that was our first customer. We now have several in that space. We're in, in different departments inside of those. Uh, fundamentally, they're taking our technology and rolling out to oil wells to, um, as an oil well depletes, um, they bring tools and analytics and what we now call AI to really power um, the oil companies to extract that last bit of, amount of oil. So their core business are these algorithms that they pull data out of probes and then tell the oil companies how to better optimize their well sites. Um, critical IP to them, as you can imagine, so they're very security conscious. Um, they're running AI workloads, so we're using GPUs, we're using Intel servers, and we're providing that service, and we've been doing that, as I mentioned, as one of our first customers for about five years now. Um, through our, our efforts and, and our channels, we've been able to expand into another, a number of other verticals. We're working with the oil and gas producers themselves, there, we're typically running at a well site, um, doing things like computer vision on methane burnoff. So if you've ever driven by a, a, a fleet of oil wells, you'll see flames coming out of some of the top of the wells. What they're doing there is burning off methane. So when you extract oil from the ground, you pump methane into the ground. And if you pump too much, you have to burn it off. And it's expensive, it's bad for the environment. So they're using computer vision to really uh, balance that amount of methane that goes into the ground and it allows them to extract oil at, uh, at the right volumes for their, their pipelines downstream. So an example of sort of a computer vision use case we're doing on the edge with the oil and gas providers. Uh, it's not just industrials in oil and gas. Um, we deal with cows, so there's an agriculture button on there. Um, we uh, recently signed an agreement with a company that has, uh, works with dairy farmers. So they have 22,000 farms, uh, and what they're deploying is a cow milking robot. So it's basically a robot, you, you, the cow walks in and it washes the bottom of the cow and extracts the milk out, does testing to figure out if it's pure, or if there's antibiotics in there, and they can do, I think, about 50 cows a day per robot. Uh, and they're rolling that out to 25,000 farms globally. So kind of an interesting use case around cows. Um, we've uh, also worked with uh, a vessel or a commercial shipping company. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later today. Same with an automotive co company we're going to highlight. And then lastly, a railroad company we're going to highlight. Uh, in the retail space, um, we were working actually with Avasa, who presented yesterday. Uh, we have a retail customer that's rolling out uh, some networking services as well as some in-store services. So better optimizing the in-store experience using edge computing. Uh, we work, uh, we get embedded in machines. Um, so there's a, a machine builder, for example, in Switzerland that builds packaging uh, robots. So think about a machine that's maybe the size of this room that produces cardboard boxes. Amazon is their biggest customer. So if you get an Amazon delivery like I do every day, they probably printed that box. Uh, they're, they're operating those machines in about 2,500 global locations and they're doing a CICD pipeline to that machine every two weeks delivering new features, turning features on and off for revenue, predictive maintenance, those types of use cases. Um, in the petrochemical space, um, we're working in the factories themselves. Uh, these are largely around safety. So think uh, computer vision for PPE, uh, device monitoring, system monitoring, predictive maintenance. Um, and then in the manufacturing space, um, we have a number of customers as well as uh, some OEMs. So we work with uh, Rockwell Automation and Emerson. They take our product, they rebrand it into their own, uh, so Factory Talk Edge, uh, Emerson Delta V. Uh, they bring in their own software and their hardware, and they take that to market uh, to their customers to optimize manufacturing or process flow. Emerson's really in the, the liquid process flow side of the house. So very diverse set of, of industries. Um, it comes from the inherent part of our, our platform that it's, uh, it's a platform product, so we can support a lot of different workloads, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but a lot of different coverage, a lot of a lot of different customers. Any quick questions on any of those, sir? Yeah, I just want to know what you guys actually do. Okay, <laughs> stay tuned. We'll be right there. <laughs> so what do we do, right? Well, we're a software solution, right? We install on commodity servers, um, things like these. Actually, I can hand these around. Um, this one has oars, so it's for swimming. Um, this one you can put over here. Actually, that's a radio antenna. Um, so we install on commodity hardware. 
we have two components to our solution. We have an operating system uh, called uh, EVE, Edge Virtualization Engine. I'm going to talk a lot in detail on that in a minute and what it provides. It connects to a cloud controller. You can think of it as an API controller that we run as a SaaS platform. We call it Zedita Cloud. I'll talk more about that in just a minute as well and how those two come together. And then much like your phone, we have a global marketplace. So on your phone, when you browse applications and you go find, uh, I don't know, your LinkedIn application, you one click, it, in, it installs on your phone. We have a very similar mechanism for how our cu customers treat their edge devices. So we have a global marketplace full of software solutions that partners bring together in, into global solutions, which again, I'll talk more about. Um, and then uh, we work with a, Many hardware vendors, uh, we support about 100 plus devices. Everything as small as a Raspberry Pi up to a pretty large Intel server with GPUs. Anything in that spectrum we can run on. Um, we also support different architectures like ARM, uh, NVIDIA, and uh, the Intel chipsets as well. Um, so starting with the cloud and kind of how, how this all comes together, um, what happens is we have a centralized state model. So what that means is the nodes themselves are kind of dumb. In effect, um, all of your policies, all of your networking rules, all of the application selection, uh, how you want to utilize the hardware, how much an application gets, for example, is all configured in our cloud. State lives in the cloud. You don't log into a node and configure it. In fact, we turn it off. You're not allowed to log into the node. There is no console access. There's no SSH access. Instead, it's all done through a secure API, which I'll talk about more in, in just a minute here. But as an admin, you set state. You decide this is the application, this is how much memory it gets, it can or cannot talk to this particular application. You use policies, um, primarily that's driven through automation. So we're an API first company. A lot of our customers use our large APIs to drive our system. Uh, we also see a fair amount of Terraform to drive our system, which kind of brings us to um, our first part of the demo today. So we are gonna do a live demo. Um, I'm going to hand the screen here to Manny in just a second here. Um, what he's going to show you are some Terraform files that we're going to use to configure uh, this on Logic device here on the table. Um, you can get a copy of that Terraform if you want to follow along. It's on our GitHub. Uh, the link is on the screen. Or you can visit our Edge Field Day uh, webpage where you'll find a link to this as well as a bunch of other materials. So can I just, Manny, do you want to jump in real quick? Just, yeah, yeah, sure. Clarify then. Yeah. So you guys provide a platform which is no application in itself, but then you go to the marketplace and download applications and be able to run on your platform at the edge. Is that that's right? correct. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Got Very it. good summary. Okay. Okay. So Manny, let me share. Yeah. Hand the share to you, and you can take them quickly through the um, through the Terraform code. So what I want to show here is. A, I'm going to execute Terraform code, uh, that code I shared in our website, so you can see exactly what we're doing. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is just running the code. This node here is not connected. It's, uh, it's actually powered off. So what I'm going to show is I'm going to deploy service chain firewall, a few VMs, uh, three Kubernetes uh, clusters come up, and then I'm going to show you in the, uh, in the management portal um, how they will be registered. So. If I can show you the management portal here, I've got three clusters that have not checked in yet. They haven't registered. So when the demo's over, you'll see those turn green. That means that the Kubernetes cluster is phoned home. They, they, they exchange the tokens, and then they'll be registered and be ready to manage. So let me minimize this. I'm going to go ahead and run the code. I'm going to do the plan first. And then I'm going to apply it. And you will see these applications being deployed. Cool. Um, these will turn green, and we'll come back to that now. All right. Thanks, Manny. Yep. So yeah, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Let me share my slides again. OK, excellent. Um, so let's switch over to Eve. Uh, and again, Eve is the Edge Virtualization Engine. It's an open source piece of software. Uh, it lives in LF Edge. Uh, there's a link on the slide here if you want to go look into the details of it. Uh, fundamentally, Eve provides a number of services. And then on the next slide, I'm going to dig into the details of Eve and kind of what are the components inside of that. But at a high level, I wanted to talk about kind of what is it first, right? So again, it's an open source piece of software. 
uh, runs on over 100 different devices. Um, and on top of it, included in that, I should say, is an embedded hypervisor. Uh, and on top of that hypervisor, we have extensive support for a number of workloads. That can be everything from virtualized network functions to legacy virtual machines. For example, we can run a Windows virtual machine on a Raspberry Pi. Um, we can also support container workloads. So we have support for Kubernetes, which we're going to demo in detail and talk a lot about. Uh, we support Avasa, which is another container manager, as well as you know, Docker, Podman, um, a lot of flexibility in terms of the infrastructure we support north of the hypervisor. And all of that, again, is managed through our, our API and, and a, a, a eventual consistency model, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we have a really strong security story. Uh, a lot of our customers, as I mentioned, run their critical assets. They run their operations, their OT on top of our platform. These devices are in the middle of nowhere, often without even people around, so they get stolen. People try and plug USBs into them in retail stores. So we have a very strong security story around protecting the, the, the identity of the device, protecting the software on the device, and we'll talk more about that as well. But that's a very important part of edge computing. Like once you take a, a server out of the data center, you lose armed guards, you lose someone to go plug a USB key in, you often lose reliable network working capability. So these are all things we've addressed inside of our product that allow our customers to really treat it like a cloud, even though it's fundamentally a device running in a truck next to an oil well in the middle of Texas, for example. Uh, Eve was designed to be lightweight from day one. Um, so we've built it uh, sort of in t instead of taking Linux and sort of stripping things out, we started with the bare kernel and added in what's primarily and very important to us. And that allowed us to keep uh, Eve into a really small footprint. It runs on one CPU or virtual CPU. It needs about a half a gig of memory and about a half a gig of storage. And then everything else on that device is available for the applications running on top. So we can pass through Z GPUs or use all the CPU. Everything else is, is dedicated to the applications that run on top. Eve itself, um, here's a, an architecture view of Eve. Um, you know, First and foremost, as I mentioned, it's an API-only solution, which means there is no local console. You don't SSH into this system and configure it like you might maybe a Red Hat system or a classic Linux system. It's too hard at the edge. If you have thousands of these devices and you have people logging in, your configuration drifts and chaos assumes, right? So we have an immutable OS. That means that the root file system is read-only. Um, and the, it's, it provides a really secure mechanism for deploying outside of your data centers. Um, and then um, with that comes uh, a, lot, a lot of I.O. virtualization. So we've done a lot of work around how do we virtualize network controllers, how do we virtualize, um, how do we pass USB uh, connections from a camera into an application, for example? How do we virtualize the GPU and make that available for AI workloads? Um, and then, so, so that's uh, in the bottom half of the stack here in the radio wireless and some of this IO virtualization piece. We've done a lot of work into that space. It's also a very pluggable architecture. Um, it can be built on different operating systems. Our default is Alpine Linux. We started with Alpine because it's very lightweight. But we have built Eve using Red Hat. We've built Eve using SUSE. Um, so it's, it's a pluggable architecture where you can bring in different kernels. Uh, you can bring in different hypervisors. So our, our default hypervisor is KVM, but we've done work with Acorn. We also support Zen. Um, so a lot of flexibility in terms of how this is used. And the fact that it's open source, people can come contribute. Uh, Acorn, for example, was a contribution from Intel. It's one of their um, real-time hypervisor products. So what determines what kernel you use for what application? So. Um, the kernel that you use for what application is what runs northbound, right? So Eve itself, you could think of as a, a virtualization solution that is the, you know, for the first thing you install on a piece of hardware. And then on top of that, you can run whatever you want. You can run Windows machines, you can run Ubuntu or Red Hat, whatever your application workload may need. We support that through our hypervisor. Does that mean you're only running one application per node? No, it means that we're running um, multiple applications. In fact, you can see on the slide here, workload one to workload X. But they all have to have the same kernel? No, no. So in a hypervisor environment, okay. if you have a hypervisor in the system, it's uh, VMware is probably the most popular hypervisor company on the planet, right? On top of that, you run virtualized machines. So think of a virtual instance of a Windows desktop or a virtualized instance of a Linux server that can run on top of that hypervisor. So our customers will bring 
Uh, for example, a window, uh, very common what we see in our customer base because a lot of our customers are industrials that have been around for a long time, is they have that one application in the corner that no one touches, no one, no one, it runs something critical, it connects to the robot or connects to the car, no one wants to touch it, often running in Windows 95 or NT, very old architectures, right? That's something they virtualize up and run on top of Eve in the hypervisor. And very often they run it right next to a modern solution like Kubernetes or something to that effect. But if, you, but if you're running a hypervisor, why are you changing the kernel of Eve? We're not changing the kernel of Eve. The, the point of Eve is it's uh, open source and pluggable. Okay, right, so the Eve kernel is fixed. Yeah. It is. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, so you, did, you just mentioned DSX, or you mentioned VMware, but I don't see that listed here. You support that as well? Um, the SXI hypervisor? Yeah. We do not. Okay. We'd be open to that. But You're just yeah. using that as, a, as an example. Yes. So, uh, and these devices, they can be clustered as well? We do support some clustering, yeah. You have so, some clustering. So, you have, you, what you have is one hypervisor per node or cluster. Correct. So, you have to pick that. Yep. You get your choice. Um, and then inside that, inside the cluster or the node, are from one to a hundred workloads. Exactly. I wouldn't even call them applications because they may just be services within a yeah. broader application. Exactly. Okay. Very, very, very well stated. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, and then what did I miss here? So uh, I've talked about our pluggable architecture. Um, zero touch updates. So um, very important that you can update not only the applications running on the, on the edge, but the operating system itself, right? So we have a dual partition environment where you can download a new version of Eve. It will stand up that version, it'll run, it'll do some sanity checks, and if things actually are functioning, it'll fail over to the, to the new version. If anything happens in that process, say maybe during the download it was interrupted or uh, there's a misconfiguration or something to that effect, it'll roll back to its last known state. One of our fundamental tenets is you should never brick a device and you should never have to send a human to go unbrick this device. Um, and it's, that's done not only on updates and the way we manage applications, but also how we, how we uh, do our installation and how we bring up these applications in the very beginning. Um, so I want to take you through kind of a quick scenario of how our customers consume, and we're going to jump back into the demo here in just a second. But most of our customers work with one of our partners, you know, on Logic, for example, where they will buy a, a system with pre-installed Eve. Just like you buy your laptop and it comes with Mac OS or Windows OS, they're buying one of these ruggedized devices with Eve OS uh, installed on top of it. Uh, when you install Eve, it's actually an Eve, uh, an install, I should say. You're not cloning a disk or something to that effect. We're actually physically binding to the machine using the TPM, which is a secure way to store uh, secrets on a device, uh, to specify uh, the device as well as the installation so that you can't spoof the device. Um, we also, as I mentioned, sort of lock down the device. There's no longer console access. If you plug in a USB, it's not going to just automatically turn on like it might on your laptop. You have to physically tell that USB on or off. And what that does is prevent tampering, right? You don't want people finding a device at a well site in, in the middle of nowhere, plugging in USB, installing malware or something to that effect. So the only way to access the device is through that uh, API. And in installing Eve is the first process in really stepping that down. Um, so I think now um, we're just going to power on this node. I don't know that Nat, Manny, you need to really show anything other than um, we. I, I do just real okay. you know, quickly just to oh, show that um, Let me that one that. node is not. Um, it's basically in a suspect mode because it's uh, it's off, and it's right there. Uh, so let me do a quick there. <coughs> And, and the point of why we split this up um, is this is how our customers use it, right? They set a, a fleet level description. And a fleet can be one device, it can be 1,000 devices, it can be 10,000 devices. And these devices come on over time. Like they don't typically ship 1,000 servers to someone and they turn them all at once. They tend to, to ship out of the factory and come online a couple, hundred, a couple hundred a week. And this eventual consistency model allows them to set that configuration once and then <laughs> come on you can see them spin up. Yeah, so you can see this node right here is the third one. Um, when I deployed the Terraform code, I deployed a bunch of VMs, uh, firewall, service chain them, and this one, because it's off, the workload is pending. So it's in a pending state. As soon as it comes online, that workload will be deployed on the, on the endpoint. Now, to show you the other two that I deployed that were up, you can see they're already registered. 
So they went into the, the management, central management of Kubernetes, registered themselves. The one that's pending is the one that you see there that needs updating. And with that, I'll turn it back to okay. Maxi. Awesome. Let me share my screen I mean, again. The, the object that's registering is a K3S cluster running inside a virtual machine on top of that hypervisor. Right. So for each of those clusters, there's, there's a virtual machine that corresponds to That's correct, to yes. It. Yeah, they, they, exactly. It's a K3S single node Kubernetes cluster yeah. coming up and then registering. And we'll show you that in detail as, as we continue here. Um, so continuing along that customer journey, uh, as I mentioned, they buy a pre-installed device, something like this on Logic. They ship it to their remote location. And then as it's powered on, uh, they give it a network connection and a power connection. And it runs through this sequence of, uh, which I'll take you through here in a minute. It also runs this every six hours for an integrity check. Um, and the first thing we do is we use measured boot. And uh, measured boot is similar to secure boot, if you're familiar with secure boot. The main difference between measured boot and secure boot is in a failure scenario. In a, in a failure scenario with secure boot, your device is bricked. You have to send a human, they have to debrick the device. In measured boot, we take that offline, we mark it as offline, we encrypt the drives, but it allows you to come back and figure out like, was I hacked or did I fat finger an, a, a characteristic, right? So again, going back to that mantra of we never brick devices, we never need to send people to the field. We chose measured boot early on as a way to kind of help versus secure boot. What it's doing is it's, it's measuring PCR values of the device and the software itself. So it uh, does a measurement. You could think of hashing the PCR value. It stores it in the TPM, so it can't be tampered with. And it does that from you know, the, the hardware, through the firmware, through the EVE operating system, all the way up the stack. So we give you sort of a, a security profile from hardware, from silicon, all the way up to the application. Um, it then connects to the cloud, which is the second step here. And it does an attestation workflow. And what that means is the, the cloud itself has those stored checksums. And it compares what it expects in the cloud with what is on the node. If they match, then it means the software stack is exactly the software stack they think it is. And we can decrypt the drives and allow you to deploy applications. If it doesn't match, again, we don't brick the device. We take it into an offline state and we trigger the, the administrator to say, you know, was it tampered with or did you fat finger one of the, one of the attestation values? Or how do you troubleshoot that? Um, and then uh, once it is trusted and that attestation flow is successful, we allow you to, the, the device decrypts the drives and allows you to then deploy applications or run applications if it's already in the field at that point. Um, and what we can unlock is really a lot of different applications. So kind of back to your question earlier, like what are we seeing in terms of customer workloads? A lot of diversity, right? Um, you know, everything from operating systems to networking solutions to OT management data solutions, more and more edge AI and inferencing showing up. Um, and then often and almost in all of our environments, we see some sort of networking. It's generally a firewall, uh, generally a commercial version. So think Fortinet, Palo Alto running, uh, either it's doing network services or it's running alongside an SD-WAN solution. So think Versa or something to that effect and then the workloads that they actually care about running behind that. So it's, think of it as almost a mini data center in itself on a single node in thousands of locations. And we give our customers tons of selection around different applications and how they can use that.